coming here today. We have a delightful group of presenters. Um, I want to begin by thanking Alan Van Hook, who's uh, helped me tremendously with uh, ideas and work in helping to organize our meeting today. Uh, I'm going to introduce our presenters very, very, very briefly. Um, we have uh, Judith Clinton from the University of California at Berkeley, who um, is interested in uh, molecular biology, organic chemistry, um, and isotope effects. Professor Vern Schramm from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, Professor Mark Siemens uh, from UC San Diego, and Martin Saunders, who, like my brothers and me, was a wrestler at City College. Um, I also want to uh, thank Professor Stan Wong uh, for uh, helping to arrange to have SUNY and Stony Brook help to pay for part of the uh, recording of today's proceedings. Unfortunately, the two people are not able to be with us today who uh, are quite important. Um, one of them is Ira, who's home uh, sick, no, uh, nursing a very bad flu. He's the uh, second brother, and Grace, who died uh, on March the 6th, and we're struggling with that. Um, the program this morning is going to begin with Alec, who's going to speak uh, on a personal note, a career note, and some personal reminiscences, followed by Judith Clement, um, uh, Professor Schramm, and then we're going to take a short break while the uh, um, catering people set up. We'll have lunch together. You're all welcome for lunch. Uh, Professor Demons will follow that, and then uh, Professor Saunders. Um, and uh, we'll also share personal remarks over lunch. Um, we're going to have dinner this evening at the Moon Bay restaurant, which is in the hotel here at 6.30. That's a um, uh, Dutch treat uh, uh, dinner, and you're all invited. So with that, Alex, why don't you 
He accepted postdoctoral appointments at Ohio State and the University of Chicago, although the University of Chicago, he was an independent fellow, not a postdoc. In 1948, Jake moved to Brookhaven National Laboratory in Upton, Long Island, and most of his scientific work during the late 40s and the 50s was spent on further developments on the theory of the reduced prediction function ratio and on its application to uh, kinetic isotope effects. In the early 60s, Jake applied the Beagle Eisenmayer approach to the theoretical understanding of condensed phase isotope effects and at the same time developed an experimental program to measure uh, vapor pressure isotope effects at high precision. I was involved in those measurements during 1961 and early 1962, together with uh, Slobodan Rindikar from uh, Belgrade and Marvin Stern from uh, Manhattan. I spent many hours in the laboratory at Upton, and as much time as I could spare, a block or two up the street from Jake's house, visiting uh, one of his neighbors, Nancy Ashton, who soon thereafter changed her name to Van Hook. She's in the room with us now. At Brookhaven, Beagle I could continue to work on vapor pressure isotope effects and isotope separation. He became heavily involved in the design of the new Brookhaven chemistry building and engaged himself in numerous outside activities. Uh, as chair of the building committee, he uh, learned all about architecture and uh, was responsible for several innovative uh, features of the chemistry building, even extending to the design of the auditorium therein and the design of the chair in the auditorium. He's always been very proud of that. Jake left BNL for the University of Rochester, where he was professor, 1968-78, and chair of the department uh, from 70 to 75, and then moved on to the State University of New York at Stony Brook, 1978-79. At these institutions, he continued an active research program, but also took on administrative responsibilities he was department chair at Rochester, 70 to 75, vice president for research and dean of the graduate school at Stony Brook, 78 to 80. He retired from Stony Brook in, in 1989, becoming distinguished professor emeritus, but continued working in isotope effects through the 90s and even into the 21st century, working out the then unexpected corrections to the Beagle Eisenmayer approach, which we label the nuclear field shift correction. Slide, this slide includes an abbreviated list. 
services on visiting committees and consultants to the national laboratories. He was instrumental in founding the Jordan Conference on Isotope Genetics in uh, 1954, 57 years ago. That conference continues to this day. In fact, it's scheduled for next February. And uh, Vernon Anderson was in the room as the, the chair of this conference. It continues to encourage widespread communication between scientists in very different disciplines who share common interests in isotope effects. Jake was appointed to 
And this comes straightforwardly out of statistical thermodynamics. The U's in the first equation are functions of the vibrational frequencies in the molecules. And they're inversely proportional to the temperature. And you can see they're also proportional to the reduced mass, to the mass. So the isotope dependence enters through that symbol Greek M, mu sub r. That's mass dependence. So the frequency depends on the mass, but it's independent of the forces in the molecule. This is a very important result. It means that isotope separation factors and isotope effects on equilibrium constants can be calculated straightforwardly from spectroscopy. And this adds important practical computation. Commenting on this paper on its 50th anniversary, Wolfsburg wrote, and I paraphrase, the quantum effect on the isotope partition function ratio can be expressed in terms of the normal mode vibrational frequency. This permits one to assess the contribution of each frequency to an isotope effect. For any given molecule, the frequencies can be expressed in terms of atomic masses and mass distributions and a set of underlying bold-faced type isotope independent lowest bold type force constant. The isotope effect is thus a direct measure of the differences in force constants at the position of isotope separation, or isotope substitution and it's this direct relationship of isotope effects to force constant changes, which is the greatest <coughs> and has led to the success of the legalizing mayor approach. So, as we go on down through there, high temperatures, everything simplifies, 
show the comparison between the experiment, experiments, which are the 
James works, which we summarize.
I guess I wasn't suggesting that I'm not that I don't have to speak at the top of my speech, which will then disappear and we'll do the talk. Um, okay. Now, one of our goals is to understand these biological catalysts well enough to go into the laboratory and to design new catalysts or to redesign. Really um, drove the field of enzymology for many, many decades. 
I'm still quite new to this. And I think I could, what I'm going to tell you about today is the way in which isotopes have led us away from this very uh, simple idea into more realistic and physical chemical ideas of how enzymes work. But this is just a little diagram to restate Fuller's hypothesis. And it just shows you that a reaction can take place in solution, that's called K uncap, or it can take place on the enzyme, that's after the substrate binds to the enzyme, that's called K cat. And if you go to this little thermodynamic cycle, which is formally correct, you can take the ratio of the two rate constants, K cat and K uncap, and relate it to binding constants, which are KTS over KS. So this thermodynamic cycle says, that if an enzyme accelerates the rate by a certain amount, this is the so-called transition state or activated complex. It's a double dagger, and it's the usual way of noting an activated complex will bond more tightly than the ground state. So, what is the ratio of K cap to K on cap? And uh, Dick Wolfenden, who um, has contributed a great deal over many decades to the field of enzymology, measured the ratio of K-cat to K-uncat. And he took a simple substrate and he put it in water, put this is without the enzyme, which is the uncatalyzed rate. He sealed the tube up and he heated it. And he waited a long time. And then he measured the comparable enzyme reaction. So all the enzymes are up here, they're very fast, and they're very similar to one another. And if you think about it, for a cell to function, each enzyme has to work at about the same rate or things would get really out of bounds. But the uncatalyzed reaction is down here and they vary all over the place. And if you go from the bottom of one line to the top, what you see is that the ratio can be as small as 10 to the 10, but as large as 10 to the 20 to 10 to the 25. That's a very large number. And I like to once again tell my students, that's the number of stars in the universe. <laughs> that's a big rate violation. So now the prediction would be that the ratio of the transition state analog to the ground state substrate might be in the same range. And I think some of the most impressive work in this area has been done by Mr. Graham, who's going to follow me on the program, who has designed molecules that do indeed show very tight binding to enzymes these molecules are designed to resemble the activated complex rather than the ground state. And this is one of his examples where he's looking at the binding of this uh, IMMGT, the hypoxanthine binding phosphoridyl transferase. The actual enzyme is not important. This is a crystal structure. Every dashed line shows an interaction between the enzyme and the bound substrate analog or pyrophosphate. And this analog binds in the peak molar range very tightly. If you compare the transition state analog binding to the ground state, it may be 10 to 6. I don't know if any of this photo you heard. Is it 10 to the 6? Is that the right ratio? Okay. So here we have a success story. We have an analog that binds 10 to the 6 fold more tightly than the ground state. But in no instance do we get anywhere near 10 to the 20 fold. Something is missing. And in the last decade, there's been a lot of recognition of the fact that so much of what dominated the early studies in biochemistry were influenced by X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography lets us look at a static structure and visualize it in three dimensions. But what's missing is the time dependence, because proteins are highly flexible and mobile molecules that when you look at them in a, in a three-dimensional structure have been frozen out into one of their average structures. So what's missing is molecular motions in proteins. What we had focused on was one dimension, but really this is a multi-dimensional problem. Now the type of motions uh, that we think about in chemistry go all the way from central seconds, which are the force constants uh, for stretching and bending, that's how I think about out to milliseconds or seconds. And these longer time scale motions are very important for proteins, which are blocking molecules, 
and which can undergo large changes between their domain structures over a distance perhaps of four angstroms in this case, and as we move along, we have smaller changes in structure and we go to shorter time. These are what we call global motion from milliseconds perhaps to nanoseconds. Now in between, we have another set of motions which are really not discussed very often in the literature, and this is where room temperature comes in. These are low frequency modes. Room temperature as a frame of reference is 200 wave numbers, and so these are fast, but clearly not the equivalent of just a harmonic bond vibration. We want to understand how these various motions contribute, and why do they influence our formal conceptualization of how enzymes work. So let's turn to isotopes. And as I said, this little combustion aspect is uh, in many ways involving the cleavage of a CH bond in our bodies. And the CH activation has provided us a direct link between chemistry and protein motion or dynamics, I'll use those terms interchangeably. So here we are with our potential energy curve and the curvature is the fourth constant that I was talking about, which is independent of isotopes. Okay, really important contributions show up here. And what you have superimposed are these zero point energy values. These are the stretching frequencies that are mass dependent. So the curvature is mass independent, the stretching frequency is mass dependent. We transfer hydrogen from the donor to a sector and we get into a so the most important thing to remember from this slide is we have three usable isotopes of hydrogen. Sodium, deuterium, and tritium has, uh, in fact, been the most powerful probe for looking at the new origin of catalysis. And also, the quantum effects of H and D, the difference in the vibrational modes comes out of the early work of the uh, Jake Vigilison and the Vigilison uh, Mayer equation. This is called difference in ground state vibrational energy. But there's another quantum effect going on. And that has to do with barrier penetration. The hydrogen can act not only as a particle, but as a wave. It is small enough that it has a certain wavelength. In fact, the wavelength is related in relation to mass. And what I like to tell my students is that if I went on a diet, a very serious diet, and got thin enough, I could go out the door without walking through it, meaning my wave would get longer and longer the thinner I got until I moved through the door. So hydrogen has a long wave, not as long as the electron, but long enough in relation to the distance over which it will travel to play a role in um, the other quantum effect, which is a barrier penetration effect, tunnel. Deuterium, with its mass of two, twice the mass of has a shorter wavelength and therefore can go through the barrier but encounters some difficulties in relation to sodium. Now some of the seminal publications by Jake are here. I've chosen uh, several that are the same as Alan's choice. The first would be the Big um, Light and Mayer equation from 1947 which pertains to equilibrium processes, and then moving from there into uh, extending those ideas to rate and uh, relative rates for sodium and deuterium. Each of these, as I state, formalizes in elegant fashion the importance of ground state vibrational differences among isotopes. So I'm going to talk about two effects that have turned up over the last 20 years that have really revolutionized our thinking about room temperature isotope effects and how they really work. And so I'm going to refer to uh, this tunneling process and discuss something called a slingshot relationship and the temperature dependence of kinetic isotope effects. So let's look at a simple reaction. We take this is an alcohol that's lost its proton that and um, 
In the process, a bond is placed between carbon and hydrogen, and we go from what's called an alcohol base to an alcohol. And we can label the uh, hydrogen with uh, tritium or deuterium. And it's useful to consider these pairs of molecules where we have protein and tritium on the top, or deuterium and tritium on the bottom. So we're looking at pairs of isotopes. Enzymes are highly regio and stereo specific. And so on an enzyme, even though these two positions can be distinguished in solution, the enzyme will distinguish the primary from the secondary position, cleave the primary and the secondary hydrogen is left behind in the product. And you can compare the rates of H to T or uh, D to T. And then you can compare the ratio of ratios, what is the KD over KT in relation to the KH over KT. Now, from the work of uh, Jake and um, people who followed in his footsteps, uh, especially Gardner Swain. I was told the other night that Gardner and Jake would often have discussions at the isotopes meeting as he called Gardner. Gardner, Gardner, not Gardner, Gardner. Anyway, I never really knew Gardner Swain, but the idea that Gardner developed was as follows. If, in fact, we have these different vibrational levels, superimposed with a different isotope. So all dependent on mass is the fourth constant is the same. And we're going through a classical transition state. We can predict the relative rate at which protium, deuterium, and tritium will react. It's just determined by these different levels in the potential energy well. And so we can actually calculate what that exponent would be. Now in fact, uh, and um, Phil Saunders is in the audience. Actually, he should be referenced here as well. Um, what was recognized with uh, time was that if, in fact, tunneling begins to occur, and in the early days it was thought that tunneling would only occur near the top of the barrier where the barrier got very thin, there would be a mass dependence on what's called barrier penetration. So let's follow this. Here's the uh, protium. It comes up, and once you get to the top of the barrier, when it's so skinny up near the top and the wavelength is long enough, it starts to just slip through the barrier. It doesn't have to get all the way to the top. Deuterium is heavier and has to go further up, and tritium, because the mass is three, gets close to the classical barrier. And so what's happening is protium is slipping through below the deuterium and tritium. That's the tunnel effect in chemistry that was really promoted by Bell, who wrote a book in 1980, and has been used by Bill Saunders as well, leading to the prediction that if protein is tunneling more than deuterium, then this value will get inflated in relation to this value, and the exponent that is needed to fit the data will be larger than 3.3. Now, here are some early data that were published. And um, over a period of about 10 years, and in fact, the ex exponents are very inflated in relation to 3.3 to around 10 to 15. Well, that was exciting. And everyone said, yeah, tunneling must be going on at room temperature in this enzyme reaction. But something was very strange here. So yes, we move beyond simple ground state effects and the tunneling effects, but yet more anomalies people are coming up. For example, the major deviations are in the secondary isotope effect. But it's the primary one that's moving the tunneling through the barrier. So why are the deviations in the secondary position? And the primary deviations are small. Okay. I think it's wonderful when, and I do tell my students this, when you don't get what you expect. It makes you very frustrated and irritable in the interim. But in the end, I think it's where we, we really start to see things differently. Now, over a period of about almost 10 years, these were measured in many different enzyme systems and with different substrates. And one thing that occurred as a result of all these very careful measurements is that the H over T isotope effect, these are secondary, never changed. We could change the rate, the substrate, now, the secondary H over T is for the substrate in which a protein is being cleaved from the carbon. 
That's where most of the termination is going on. If the secondary H over T is abnormal because it's coupled into the primary position, whatever these perturbations are contributing to the system should show up in the H over T because the H over T is constant. And the only thing that's changing was the D over T, where deuterium tunneling in a tunneling correction model should have been less. And all the exponential deviations come from the second column. And this is just to show it graphically. All the H over T measurements are almost as imposable as the trends in the exponent. This would be the semi classical range without tunneling into the tunneling range, correlates completely with the secondary T over T ratio. This is opposite to what you expect for a tunneling correction. So here we are, stuff again, right? Non ground state effect. It's not a tunneling correction. It helps that we had an x ray structure, and the colors aren't very clear here. A uh, one of the um, tunneling variants, this is an enzymatic study. And what we're just looking at is the bound cofactor. It's going to accept the hydrogen, it's called NAD. Here's the bound substrate, it's going to contribute a hydrogen. It will come from here to here. This is an analog that will be at. So we can see the structure by x-ray crystallography. We make a mutant, we take up all the residues such as a valine, which is an amino acid side chain that has a bulk heat. We reduce the size and went to alanine, which means we have less material filling the space. And the reactive ring of the NAD, which is called an nicotinamide ring, moves out of the plane and away from the substrate. So from this study, we could see that when we were making these mutants, that were changing the uh, deviations from the plane child relationship, the cofactor was moving away from its reactant. So here's the idea. Here's an idea. What we start to move in on is a picture of enzyme catalysis that involves active site compression. So I'll throw that right out to you in the beginning. So here's our carbon that's going to contribute a hydrogen or deuterium. Here's the acceptor, donor acceptor distance. Now the idea is that the hydrogen is moving by tunneling. It's clearly not classical. If we have our initial distance, uh, which is usually van der Waals, this would be 3.2 to 3.5 angstroms. In order for tunneling to occur, we have to get closer. And so for tunneling to occur, we have to get at about 2.8 angstroms. Now, if in an enzyme, we can actually um, start out with a, an R0 that is pretty close to what we need for the tunneling, it, it gets pretty crowded. Right? And in deuterium, because it has a larger mass, requires that the donor and acceptor get even closer. It could be that for the deuterium tunneling, the crowding is so large that the rearrangement of the bond that are not being cleaved, that are called the secondary effects, are in, is impeded. And therefore, we get these very small secondary KD over KT secondary isotope effects because there's not enough room in the active site for the full, um, we call it, inner reorganization to occur. On the other hand, if you mutate the enzyme, and in the situation I showed you where things start to move apart, now we start from a longer distance. Yes, we have to move in further, just as we did before, but we never get as close because we compromise the distance between the donor and acceptor. This would be our native enzyme, this is our mutated enzyme. Now, in fact, there's enough room for both the uh, secondary protium and tritium to adjust, as well as the secondary deuterium and tritium to adjust, and we'll get close to normal secondary DPI effects, and the exponents look more semi classical. So, this is a, a geometric picture of what may be going on. So, what we learned over many years is that from this uh, measurement, which was named after the Gardner twin, is that the properties are non classical for these enzymatic reactions, but they're not consistent with a simple tunneling correction to transition.
to the point, that's really what we had to work with. And we could make a proposal at that point that the native enzyme appears to generate a more compressed active site configuration than is normally seen in solution. And that's why the DT secondary isotope effects are aberrant. And when we make mutants and things can move apart, we start to approach the more classical predictions, which are the first. Okay, so I planted a seed in your mind now. And this is that there's something about an active site that allows things to get very close together, closer than we would anticipate in solution. Well, let's talk about the temperature dependence I'd like to just say. Alec also introduced this in the context of the way it really works. Once again, this just shows the movement through the barrier as opposed to over the top of the barrier. Now, as um, we heard from Alec, when you go to very high temperature, so this, these are just plots of, of the natural log of the grape, which is one of the temperature, and this is the very high temperature regime. As we go to very high temperature, those brown state vibrational levels that we saw in the previous uh, slide and earlier get closer and closer together. So as you raise the temperature and go to excited vibrational mode, the spacing between the light and heavy isotopes begin to disappear. And in the limit of very high temperature, you expect the differences to essentially go away, and we extrapolate back onto this line to a value that's called A, an Arrhenius prefactor, and there's no difference between H and D. This would be the semi classical effect based on just the ground state vibrational difference. And that would come from Jake's work. If we then go into the tunnel effect, what happens with tunneling? Tunneling is mass dependent. Here's the uh, tunneling for D. We'll just leave that alone for now. And let hydrogen and protein tunnel quite a bit so this slope gets more shallow. These lines start to cross. And it was shown theoretically and experimentally that if you go back now to infinite temperature, the lines cross. And in fact, the D line intercepts the y-axis above the h-line, and we get this prediction of the ratio of a protium over a deuterium being less than one. And it has to do with differences in slope. The slope of the d in this extreme example would stay the same. The slope in the h-line would come down because we can get to product through the barrier and there's not as much of an activation, and we have a different But what do we think? Once again, over many years, and this is starting in 1999 and up to the present time now, we get a much different observation most of the time. Which is if we look at the temperature dependence of the chaos, it's not semi classical and it doesn't resemble a tunnel correction, in fact. It looks like there's very little difference in the energy of activation for the protein and the deuterium. So this is an observation where A, H over A, D is greater than 1. The previous slide shows you either it should be 1 or less than 1. So here we are again with the prediction that is not upheld. So this is what we see on this slide. In fact, uh, Within the temperature range, mind you, enzymes can only be interrogated within this particular temperature range. Within the temperature range that we can look, the slopes are essentially the same, so that there's no difference in activation energy between the light and heavy isotopes. How can that be? And this is largely unprecedented in the chemical literature. There's some evidence for it, but very little. Let me just impress upon you how bizarre this is. Here's a simple transition state picture of Arrhenius behavior, and let's see what happens. This is a line, this is our high temperature regime. This would be the sort of thing Jake was talking about, where as you go to high temperature, the difference between H, D, and T will all converge to a single point on the y axis. Let's say there's a tunneling correction. We start moving through the barrier. We want to go over the top. Here's the middle regime. Protein is lighter. So the rate starts to level off. It's faster for protein, and then it levels off a little bit. The deuterium is not at all. 
portrait of the human in temperature regime. And then you can go to very low temperature, and what happens is the lines will level off eventually, the T will level off as well. And now, at close to absolute zero, yeah, you do get temperature-independent isotope effects. But this is only at very, very low temperature. And, and when the entropy of activation goes to zero, because all the reaction is happening by this tunneling. But enzymes work at room temperature and have sizable energies of activation. What's going on? So our models have to change. And what has emerged, that doesn't mean this is the final picture, but this is what the experimentalists working with the theoreticians have evolved to. And I think it's worth um, pointing out, I'll show you one equation, and, and hopefully that will convey what's going on. If we think of the movement of hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium, actually, as always occurring as a wave and through the barrier, that's the first premise. These are all pure quantum effects through the tunneling behavior. And we think about what is it that controls the movement of the hydrogen as a wave through the barrier? Well, it's the heavy atom environment that controls it. Because we have to get everything just right for the hydrogen to move as a wave. And so in the first coordinate, so this becomes what we call a multi-dimensional problem. In the first coordinate, we have to get the energy levels such called degeneracy, such that there can be equivalent energy levels. This is your ground state vibration level. You have to get equal energy levels so the waves can move back and forth. This is disallowed, this is allowed, and then you write the degeneracy, you go with the product. How does that happen? That happens through varying the electrostatic within the active side of the person. The other thing that has to happen is the distance may not be right for hydrogen to move this way. And so now they have to modulate the distance between the donor and the space. The frequency and the distance over which it will move. Here is our mass dependence. The mass dependence that Jake first spoke about in his early paper shows up now in the Frank Condon term, which is a wave function overlap term. It's very different from the stretching, brown space stretching room. Now, this is mass dependence and temperature independence. So we've got these two exponential temperature dependence, mass independence, mass dependence, temperature independence, that nobody can give us these parallel lines. But when things aren't absolutely optimal, we have to take into account the distance space and coordinates. And this is going to allow the donor and acceptor transiently to move closer together. And this is going to be mass dependent, so deuterium tries to get closer than uh, protein and also temperature dependent because you have to put in energy to get the donor and acceptor distances to change. So, when hydrogen transfer is fully quantum mechanical, we can easily explain both temperature independent and temperature dependent KIE. This is the one that we uh, addressed halfway through this presentation, where this is what we have been seeing over and over again in this it's the situation where, in fact, we don't need much distance sampling. We're already, the distance is already optimized for hydrogen transfer. And in fact, the implication is that the donor and acceptor are already at about 2.8 electrons. We don't need to adjust the distance very much. If we make mutants or go to perturbing conditions, non-optimal conditions, we often see the graph on the left go into the graph on the right in many, many conditions where this interconversion occurs. And, but this is considered a non-optimal condition where now we have to introduce some of this distance in the data. So here's, here's what the equation will predict. So when there's no distance sampling, we can actually see equal energies of activation for the heavy and light isotopes. Now, since Van der Waals is 3.2 to 3.5 octaves, heavy atom to heavy atom. Yet tunneling requires something in the range of 2.7 to 2.8 octaves. Once again, the idea of compression comes in. What aspect of protein structure dynamics allows the achievement of close tunneling geometry? What is it about proteins that allows us to get these compressed conditions? Now, I could go on for a long time, but I don't know how much, I think I should probably be finishing up. Take as long as you want. 
Well, now, you don't mean that. <laughs> My talk is in modules. I think I'll talk about one more module and then try to tie it together. What I wanted to do was build a case for you. What I've done up to this point is show you how we progress from the simple brown state stretching model to a, a tunneling through the barrier model and how enzymes show many other behaviors that imply active site compression and this transient achievement of this very persistent system. So let me spend a little bit more time talking about how in the world do enzymes do that. Now, um, we have chosen to work with thermophilic proteins. A thermophile, if you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park and seen the geysers, there are organisms that live exposed to 100 degrees. And um, that means that they're robust. They last for a long time even if you heat them up. Most proteins, if you cook an egg, you watch the protein be major. So these are uh, systems that allow us to look over a, long, a larger temperature regime with a protein that would normally occur. And I have um, two systems here. One is the alcohol dehydrogenase again, where we transfer a high by from alcohol to the cofactor and And the second one is where we're transferring a high drive from a co reduced cofactor to this C double bond end. I'm just going to talk briefly about the high temperature alcohol Now, um, this, in order to give you a sense of this, this, this is, these are protein molecules. And this is a protein that exists with four units that aggregate into a tetramer. And they're different colors, navy, cyan, tea green, red. Colors are very rare with some of these. And um, there are metal ions in these proteins. So this is all protein backbone. These are metal ions. Away from the active site, these are active site nodes, these are zinc ions. So it's a tetramer, and 148 kilograms, very large molecules. They have two zincs, as I've already told you. The region in the middle is where the, the subunits come together, and the cofactor binds in this region and the substrates over here. So these are separate domains for either the cofactor or the substrate. Now we had an observation uh, published in 99 at Ron Cohen's postdoc in my lab as the first author. Who, by the way, I sent his apologies. He um, uh, was very fond of Jake and but regrets that he could not be here. So here we see that we're just plotting, this is Z max remember, the, the log of the rate constant versus one over G. Here's the proteal line. Now this was an astonishing observation at the time. We didn't understand it. Because the lines were parallel above 30 degrees, and they broke below 30 degrees. The isotope effect showed no temperature dependence in the uh, high temperature regime, which is where the enzyme normally functions. And the isotope effect became very temperature dependent below 30 degrees. So just by varying the temperature, we could see this transition Now the thing we needed to do was to try to link the motion of the protein to the change in behavior. The idea was it was the heavy atom motions that were different, and that's why the KIU went from being temperature independent to dependent. And this is another technique that uses deuterium, and I thought it would be useful to show it in the context of honoring this change. And what we're doing here is very different, so let's take a minute and understand what's going on. We have a protein, it's all folded up, and every amino acid is linked by a peptide bond. You own the peptide bond, there's, there's the proteum, on the nitrogen. And what happens is proteins, as I said, are undergoing these local fluctuations. They open and close. When they open, we expose the amide linkage. And if the solvent is D2O, and if it's basic, meaning deuteroxide as a catalyst, it can come in, pluck off the proteum, replace it with the deuterium. The protein can then fold back up again, and we put, place deuterium from the solvent into the backbone of the protein, called HD exchange. You then quench after a certain amount of time by going to low temperature pH, and you break the protein into small bits. In this case, we get 21 distinct peptides covering 98% of the 
And we ask the question, what's the rate of exchange? And it's going to be looked under the conditions that we do the experiment. The product is very simple. It's just what's the equilibrium between the open and closed forms of the protein, local flexibility versus the intrinsic rate of exchange once you're open and then solving the That's our case approach. Now, out of 21 peptides, I show you only five. 21 peptides use uh, 16 behave pretty normally, which is we went between 10 degrees and 65 degrees, and as we raised the temperature, we were able to see more and more deuterium into um, the peptides at the end. So the, the amount of deuterium just went up in regular fashion. I apologize for the poor quality. I think it's because we're using a different kind of computer today, but hopefully you can make out the patterns here. The reason these five peptides are chosen is that um, these are peptide one, four, two, seven, and three, so one, two, three, four, seven, that we saw virtually no difference between 10 and 20 degrees, and only when we went to 30 degrees did we start to see an increase in the amount of exchange. And what that meant was that there was a break between 20 and 30 degrees. And it has to be a break in protein flexibility because all of a sudden when we get above uh, at those two thirty degrees, we start to see much more exchange into the backbone of the protein. And you can actually plot um, at each temperature now the K cat versus a weighted average rate constant or exchange of deuterium into the backbone. And these are these five peptides, and we get a correlation coefficient which are uh, really quite good, a one-to-one -one correlation. That is. The protein displays a change in its flexibility at 30 degrees, just like the isotope effect went from temperature independent to temperature dependent. And the peptides that undergo this change in flexibility, some of them are near to the metal factor <coughs> substrates over here. Some, this is the substrate domain. Some of them are right near the substrate, but some of them are far away from the substrate. Transition in protein motion, and that's the key to taking us from this low temperature to this high temperature regime, that allows greater flexibility within local regions of the protein such that we get faster deuterium exchange. And this transition is occurring for the navy blue, that's a transition at 30 degrees, and we had a second transition at about 45 degrees of cyanide. Note, these changes in flexibility link the solvent the active site, which is right here in Surrey, and they are not distributed equally over the entire protein, but are fairly local. So we're starting to get a picture of what's going on. Now I'm going to actually go to, I'm going to skip way ahead, because um, I can summarize this point and then just go to one summary. Ever since these studies, we've been building, 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 trying to understand and expand what we think is going on. But this, this initial result, I think, was really important. It shows we could increase the flexibility of the protein in the physiologically significant range, which is above 30 degrees. The isotope effect goes from temperature dependent, below 30 degrees, this is the non-physiological range, to temperature independent, above 30 degrees, indicating a more rigid active site at the physiologically relevant condition. That means there's some kind of inverse relationship overall protein flexibility to create these compressed catalysts in viable acid sites. And the conclusion, which is what we have been working on the last six uh, years, seven years, is that it's the ability of the protein to sample conformational substates that determines the active site geometry. And so if I just go way ahead, um, never can judge time. So, to sum up, the way we conceptualize how proteins work at this point is that they're really, it's, it's a thought experiment, but it guides us in how we design our experiments. We need to think of at least two classes of protein motion. And the first one is what we call pre-organization. It's basically the proteins are moving all the time, they have a landscape. And so, let's say 100% 
of the protein is represented here, and the protein is moving with small barriers among all these different states. Some subset of those substates shown in green are going to get the donor and acceptor close enough that the hydrogen can move to the band. Those are the catalysts of viable conformational substrates. This is a probability event. We believe it's largely entropically driven, and I have some data that actually show that experimentally. It's, it's a very controversial point, which we don't have to belabor this morning. When you perturb the system, which we can do by mutagenesis, low temperature, etc., we force the protein into the wrong set of conformational substrates, and that has an impact on how close we can ever get. Again, we're tunneling, and that's why we go from temperature independent KIE to temperature dependent KIE. These are more global motions, more local in the region of where the substrates are bound. We have this term called reorganization. This comes out of that formal equation of tunneling that I showed you, in which we have, um, we believe, more local motion. This is in some ways an artificial separation, but I think it's an extremely important one in terms of how we design experiments and think about what's going on. And once again, when we have the correct conformation of the substrate, we get very close between the donor and acceptor. Delta R is a relatively unimportant term, the temperature independent KIE, weird swing shot relationships, etc. And um, once again, we have some evidence that suggests that it's these electrostatic uh, reorganization within these close distances that's a dominant contributor to the entropic band. Okay. So, in 20 years, we've regressed quite a bit, a long, long, long time. Uh, we first showed something, me and others, of course, and then the importance of the protein backbone into the catalysis, because tunneling itself is, is uh, temperature independent, the actual motion is, the quantum mechanical motion has no temperature dependence there. And also the importance of, of uh, what appear to be distinct classes of protein motion. And in our definition, the first motion is about the overall protein flexibility to get these properly reorganized conformations. And then the second class is the tuning of the reaction coordinates to electrostatic and perhaps some distance sampling if things aren't optional. And I think these really, what started out to be classical, or some classical effect, pioneered by Jake and his co-workers, flame shock relationships, temperature dependency, KIE, have incredibly given us details of the after site we couldn't get from other things. A major finding is that we need overall protein flexibility to get compressed catalytic deprived sites. In a recent study, we have, we have extended the studies on hydrogen transfer to methyl transfer. We're very excited about this because the methyl group can't tunnel, but won't tunnel appreciably with an atomic mass of 15. So it looks like it's not just the hydrogen itself, but in fact, what we're seeing is a generic property of enzyme catalysis, similar evidence for protein control active site compression. So here's a picture of an enzyme. Here's our tiny little active site. Here's the rest of the enzyme. For years, bioorganic chemists were trying to design catalysts based on these regions here. It won't work. The non-active site portion of the protein is at least as important as the active site portion. And so it's really the what's happening in this region that allows us to achieve a huge rate of acceleration. Moderate rate of acceleration, perhaps without all that um, what at first appeared to be garbage. It's almost like the non-coding region of uh, nucleic acid, which is the first we saw to be removed. So I would say that in conclusion, studies over the last 50 years are validation of the brilliant insights by Jake regarding the important ones by itself. And um, just to highlight um, a few people, because I didn't talk about everything, but I wanted to, but uh, I wanted to acknowledge Michael Masters at the University of Massachusetts, who actually saw how the Marcus Life equations could be extended to hydrogen transfer following on the work of Kuznetsov, Holtzup, and Actually, a very active school of electrical 
explain child relationships were what people thought. It wasn't a simple tongue interaction in um, a certain class of art. Amalek poems started the high temperature ADH work, and Zhao Zhang and Yang um, did the HD exchange in collaboration with uh, Catherine and Natalie Khan and Brian Benson, who did the extra crystallography. Um, and I didn't get a chance. to uh, come to the United States 
and he has an appointment at uh, Washington State University. He needs uh, graduate students wanting to contact him. And with that, Jacob went to Washington State University for two years, and then um, on to Cal. And uh, when he arrived at Cal, uh, he had had in mind that uh, he was going to study nuclear chemistry. But almost immediately when he arrived, he received a summons from G.N. Lewis. And that's not a summons that one can resist. And when he got to Lewis's uh, office, Lewis said, you're going to be my assistant. Well, that was that. And so he spent two years with Lewis. Um, and that leads to another part of growing up with uh, Jacob, which I'm going to remark on now. And that is, uh, at least speaking for myself, he was never able to explain anything about science to me. Um, I always said the same thing, well, I don't know if you feel that way or not. Um, but uh, we would ask him questions about how the world would work, and his answer was always the same. Why can't you figure that out for yourself? <laughs> um, and uh, the last time I asked him that, which was about, uh, about 10 minutes ago, I also got the same answer. Um, in any event, though, uh, in uh, 1943, he was about to leave Cal, and his successor um, was Michael Kasha, who was to be Lewis's next assistant. In fact, he was Lewis's last assistant. And Michael Kashi came to Jacob and asked him a question about something which I don't know what it was, having to do with chemistry, and his answer was exactly what I just said. Why don't you go figure that out for yourself? <laughs> uh, he went on to the Manhattan Project, as you know, and once again returned to Uri, um, working closely with uh, Mia Mayer. Now, as we grew up, we really knew nothing about the work that he had done uh, at the Manhattan Project or with Maria Mayer. He would talk about Maria Mayer and Joe Mayer, and we just thought that they were his friends, as he spoke about uh, Harold Dury. Um, but uh, this then begins uh, another aspect of Jacob, and that was he was a great practical joker. And one of the things that few scientists know is that if you have an idea or a question or a thought, you want to be able to get up from your desk and walk down the hall and talk with your colleague right away and say, here, listen to me about this idea and what do you think? And you don't want anybody to stand in your way. In a hardware store in New Orleans, and knew all about how to fit all of these hardware things together and taught Jacob how to pick locks. So while the FBI was there, had a little ceremony admiring the gate and the door and the fence and all of that. Jacob reached into his pocket, took out a little lock pick, and picked the lock and walked in and shut the door. And they were all still looking in. They said, wait a minute. We have an issue keys to this place. And um, that was the kind of thing that uh, he used to do. Um, he, uh, as you know, did the scientific work at Columbia, and those of you who are chemists know uh, much, much more about that than I do. Went on to Ohio State, and then on to um, Chicago, where he worked with uh, Fermi. Um, it was in the late 40s that he went to Brookhaven, where Paul and Ira and I were born. And uh, Eastern Long Island is kind of sort of place where you might think that the earth is flat because everything there is flat and also um, if you go a little bit further east you'll fall off the end of the earth. It's very, very isolated and um, most of the uh, intellectual cultural life surround was uh, the place at the way of the Brookhaven. Um, he did two terms of work uh, during the summer at uh, Los Alamos and uh, many years, not, not too long ago, I asked him, what were you doing at Los Alamos? And he said, well, I um, had a theory that uh, if you had uh, a, a water molecule that was made of uh, uh, H1 and H3, it would behave differently from if you had one that was made of H2 and H2. And uh, that's what I was 
think I'm right on that. If I'm mistaken, you'll correct me. And uh, he said, and that was what I was doing at Los Alamos, was uh, trying to find out if that would work. Um, it was a happy time for us, and uh, we learned about uh, Native American culture and visited uh, Santa Fe quite often. Uh, a little bit more about that later. Um, he went on to, uh, uh, went, went back to uh, Brookhaven, and then he had an appointment at the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Syria. And uh, I already Paul and I went to Swiss schools, learned to speak German and Swiss German, and all three of us were Swiss Boy Scouts. Uh, uh, there was a very, very, very small Jewish community in uh, Bayport. The uh, synagogue that was there when he first got to uh, Bayport was one in Pacdog, and he and his friends didn't like that one very much, and so he and uh, a couple of other people were instrumental in forming a synagogue called the uh, Sayville Jewish Community Center, uh, where all three of us went to Hebrew school, and uh, all three of us uh, were bar mitzvah, and uh, it's still there. Um, I should uh, neglect to mention Nancy Ashton, who's married to Alan Van Hook, and babysat for us when we were quite young. Um, had been assigned to uh, organize a scientific meeting, and one of the people who was going to be present was Edward Teller. And Edward Teller had a reputation for being a rather difficult person, and Jacob disliked him very much. And uh, so he figured that in order to make the uh, meeting a little bit more comfortable, at 10 o'clock in the morning, he arranged to have a cocktail served. And, <laughs> and until a month before he died, I saw him. He said, yes, not only that, but it was my rationing stamps that I had to use to pay for those cocktails. Anyway. Um, he uh, also was given the well, I should tell you what Brookhaven Lab was like in the uh, late 40s and early 50s. It had been an army camp. And so all of the buildings were these army barracks that had been pushed together. And it just didn't really work that well for doing scientific work. They needed a new chemistry building. And Jacob was given the job of being the leader of putting that together. And so he started to do some homework began to read architectural record and figured out who the leaders in architecture were. He went to meet 10 architects and he told me the names of all of them. I don't remember all of them, but I'll tell you the ones that I remember. Uh, they were uh, I.M. Pei, Paul Rudolph, uh, Philip Johnson, Ludwig Mies von der Rohe, and Marcel Breuer. There were five others, but those of you who know about architects know that they were, oh, Eero Saarinen was another. Um, those of you who know about architects you know that they were uh, among the leaders in the 20th century. And after having interviewed all of them, he decided that Breuer was to uh, be the one who would do the design. Breuer did quite a bit of work and he prepared a set of basic plans, but the government would not approve his commission to complete the work. This is why. In order to get a commission to do architectural work with the government, you have to have a certain number of points. And the best way to accumulate points is to have a previous track record of having done government work. Well, Royer had not done very much work for the United States government, and so uh, they didn't like that. Jacob had gone to see someone who was um, high up in the government whose principal background was not in building design, but uh, in the military. And when Jacob said, I'm nominating Marcel Breuer to do the design work, uh, 
the uh, man said, Marcel Breuer, what architecture firm is he with? And Jacob knew that was the end of that. Um, as it turned out, uh, a man named Robert Gatti came in, and uh, he took over the basic plan that Breuer had drawn and uh, implemented it. And um, uh, those of you who are still working at BNL can talk about how that's working out now. Um, uh, but he was called upon to consult at other places for design of uh, architectural buildings, including a new chemistry lab at uh, Cornell that was also designed by uh, Bob Gatti. Um, some of you have heard about cold fusion. Um, it was a huge fraud, perhaps not as big a fraud as the Texas called sulfur fraud, uh, or Billy Sol Estes, but an enormous fraud. And uh, Jacob was one of the people who had gone about uh, to uh, help to debunk that. Um, he uh, went to work at the lab at Stony Brook uh, until he was 85 years old. Um, and of course, we all miss him. Um, I'm inviting all of you to uh, also speak about him as well. Well, my claim to fame is that when Jake moved from Brookhaven to Rochester, I bought his boat, which when he owned it, he assured me was the fastest boat on the Great South Bay. <laughs> somehow, it never was quite that fast. <laughs> <clears throat> but I wanted to add something about his days at Columbia, because I believe I heard this correctly from Jake, that when this uh, door went up and he was on the outside, of course, he did not like that at all. And uh, at some point, while well, he was being excluded from what went on on the other side of the door, he had to hear a slight explosion and a sudden flash of green light which he recognized as the color of boron when it, when it burns in a flame, maybe from fireworks or something. So he immediately started to work and made a number of calculations about isotopes involving boron, isotopic exchange reactions, and he then proceeded to walk past the point with Harold Urey, where he presented these calculations to Harold Urey, upon which Jake became part of the project. Paul Beagle and uh, I want to thank everyone for coming today. This is wonderful. Uh, growing up with my mom and dad, my brothers was a special treat. There were um, a lot of wonderful people who came by into our family, who uh, my dad, sometimes my mom also would invite to visit us. Um, one of the special treats was uh, that for a while my dad was in charge of the speaker series Dad had broadened that speaker series to include not only scientists, but famous musicians, actors, and a, a variety of other kinds of people. And uh, at, the, uh, at the end of those lectures, oftentimes those people came over to our house, which was about 20 miles from the, the lab, and they would have a party, a soiree, or whatever uh, you might want to call that. And it, um, that extended uh, somewhat. You know, when we moved to Rochester. So there were a lot of interesting people to meet there, um, <clears throat> many Nobel laureates, and a lot of social uh, scientists, and um, some very famous musicians, and it was a lot of fun to have them come over and meet them. One day when we moved to Rochester, my mom said, um, <clears throat> well, you ought to stay around tonight, because uh, Ira is going to sing Maybe she just said Ira, I don't really know, because that's my brother's name, Ira, he's a singer. He didn't really play the piano, but I, you know, I mean, that was part of his job as a singer, but he could play the piano. And um, what I missed was when I stayed around him was soiree like 
surprising about my dad was that I never realized that he was competitive until he got older. Now, uh, to a child, competitive is somebody who wants to go out and play football with you or you know, come and watch your sports and be interested. That's what competition means to a boy. Okay? That's a competitive person. Okay? And my dad, you know, he, he liked exercise. His idea was to walk to the refrigerator. <laughs> Glazer. I've been married to uh, Jake's niece, Andrea, since 1965, and I'm going to tie two themes that I've already heard together. The sailboat and Jake as a jokester. Uh, Andrew and I were married on Grace and Jake's backyard in Bayport, and the day before our wedding, Jake and the boys took me out on the sailboat. I had never been on a sailboat. And true or not true, my recollection is that it was very choppy, that I was feeling pretty rotten, that one or more of them kept yelling at me, shift to that side, jump to this side, and duck because this thing is coming this way, duck because this thing is coming that way. And I had the recurring thought during that sale that I was never going to make my wedding the next day. <laughs> I think only in years to come did I realize it was more or less a practical joke on Jake's part that kind of shaped me and rattled me a little bit. Perhaps kind of see what I was made of. Thank you. 
feel so proud of the country of uh, escorting him to the stage. And I, I will never forget that because it just reaffirms how we all felt about him. That he was really a man. Henry Sobel, otherwise known as Hank Sobel, for Jacob anyways. Uh, we were family friends for many years. Uh, I was on the faculty uh, uh, in chemistry at the University of Rochester when, when he was the chairman of the department. And over the years, we used to invite uh, Jacob and Grace to our Adirondack home uh, near the Lake George area, we had 20 acres of woods and a home on that uh, property. And I'm, I'm reminded by uh, two rather amusing uh, events that, that happened in one of their visits. One was uh, Lourdes had studied uh, how to do French pastry. I sent her out to Colorado with, uh, okay. <laughs> in any event, she, uh, the next word is uh, cook, but this, this time she, she specialized in French pastry, and, and Jacob and Grace knew this. So on one of the occasions, after dinner, David brought, brought out his acetylene torch. I'm sorry, before that, he brought out his acetylene torch. For what reason? He wanted to caramelize the uh, sugar. I wonder about what of the witnesses deserve where she would be making that evening. Well, of course, that was, that was uh, a big fun experience. And uh, you can imagine Jake running around. I'm sure he was very good at glass blowing, but he also did other things of uh, this kind, talking about his pranks that were uh, having fun. The other thing I'd like to mention is uh, Jacob uh, had problems as he got older in, in breathing, had uh, probably a heart cardiac, I'm not sure. But in any event, he loved to take walks in the morning, and the two of us would go together and uh, take long walks in the uh, backwoods and the other on the roads and so on. And uh, one the morning, we got up, and I noticed that it had rained that night, and a ray of light hit his nose. Now, I'm an MD, and I forgot the name of this particular uh, type of syndrome, but he immediately sneezed as soon as the light hit his nose. And he, he told me, yes, he has always had that particular problem throughout his lifetime. I'm wondering whether he's carried it through to the boys. <laughs> Yeah, there we are. So uh, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Very funny. Bill Sullivan, 
And so, <laughs> so I was, I was talking to such a boy in my degree, so I was talking to Jason, you know, he and I really are raising ready for myself to do what they want to do. So I think that's the best thing you can do as a parent, is to kind of call up people and say, oh, I'm not sure about that. And I tell them, so I don't know what kind of you are going to do, but the other one is just, I, I, I just say, it's such a moment where, gee, maybe I wasn't pushing on kids. This social worker, Cindy It's not either fine. I, I didn't know him at all. I wish I did. Uh, I'm Ron Fisher. Uh, but Dick Shelley, who isn't here and would have liked to have been, uh, made a comment to me about the company license that I remembered. And I'd like to share it because Dick would have wanted to be here. And, and he was mentioning something about me and the name of And don't forget, Jacob Beekelizing was the head of the isotope police. You couldn't do anything with isotopes without his making sure that it was correct. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure you know what he's talking about. <laughs> I just wanted to share that with Dick's observation. Thank you.
Two of Sammy's daughters and one of his granddaughters are here, uh, and uh, they uh, ended up uh, owning a hotel that Sammy had, it, which is the oldest hotel in North America, on the ponds of the Santa Fe. Um, it is the uh, best hotel in Santa Fe. Uh, if you want to stay there, contact you. <laughs> <laughs> This is partners. Uh, uh, I've also neglected to mention that he used to tell a story about Abe Friedman. May I tell the story? You're going to tell it anyhow. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll give you your permission. Okay, the story was that uh, when Abe was a young man, uh, Abe grew up in a very, very uh, uh, observant religious household. Not really. Well, that's the story. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> this is as it was told, anyway. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, he had gotten sick as a young man. He had uh, trichinosis. But he didn't want his mother to know that he had uh, eaten pork. And so when he found out that he had gotten sick, uh, she said, what's the matter with you? And he said, and he was, you know, at a loss as to what to say. So uh, uh, just at the very moment, uh, he said, well, I have syphilis. <laughs> Thank you. 
Does anybody else? Yes, Nina. Uh, my grandfather, Matt, was uh, Jacob's uncle. And I just wanted to recall a, uh, a time when uh, Matt came to visit uh, my family in Texas. And it was in the 60s. And it was, I guess, some time previously, uh, Jacob had received one of the many awards that were listed on one of the PowerPoint presentations. I don't recall which, but there had been an article in the New York Times, and my grandfather kept that clipping in his pocket and must have shown it on this one visit to Texas, you know, at, at least uh, I don't know, six or eight times, a dozen times in the grocery store, <laughs> and here to all the friends of my parents, and, uh, Anyone he could possibly, he was just so incredibly proud of, of, of Jacob. And I feel um, very regretful uh, that, uh, that I, I don't know if anyone recorded Jacob, but he was, he had such a keen memory and he was a repository of all the family lore. And he, uh, many mysteries that I had about certain characters that I knew very well, he, he, he was able to just, it all together and have a, a good overview of the motivation for people's behavior, even though he didn't seem like such a uh, psychological type. He was. <laughs> I'm Alex Harris. I'm the current chair of the Brookhaven. I had a, a chance to meet Jake when I first arrived there in the early 2000s. I came in 2003 to Brookhaven. Um, and it was related to the building. Um, as has been mentioned, Jake was asked by Dick Dodson, the first chair of the department, to head up the building committee. At the time, the chemistry department was housed in barracks of former Cap Camp Upton. And I think Dick, probably recognizing that this would be a battle, to get adequate space for the chemistry department, made Jake the chair of the, of the building committee. And uh, they wrote up a memo, gave it to a, an assistant to the lab director, who was, I think, a former admiral, um, who was charged with going around and figuring out what they would do about their building infrastructure. And that not having heard anything uh, for a while, they checked with the director and were told, oh, well, we've heard that the chemistry department is adequately housed in these old barracks and you don't need new space. And so Jake's first challenge was to then go and change the mind of the admiral and inform him that, in fact, the chemistry department would be getting new space. Um, they were then told that they'd get a government uh, architect to do the normal thing, which is design a, a national lab building and in the normal way. And Jake made the argument that, no, we can do much better if we go to really good architects. And so this this series of famous architects became a process where he had to demonstrate that by going to these well-known architects, he could do better than they would do, that it wouldn't come in more expensive, and that they would get a better job. And uh, I.M. Pei was one of the candidates, and he was not chosen to, to be one of the finalists because he made clear that he would retain the rights to any plans he would give them. I'm not sure what that means for a building, but that was unacceptable to the government, and so he was uh, not one of the final uh, people. Uh, Earl Saranen was another candidate, and I, as, as Jake told me, he wasn't that impressed when he started looking at some of the buildings that Earl Saranen had done, so Saranen got moved to the side. And in the end, Marcel Breuer became the finalist, and he uh, had a person from his firm stationed with the department for more than a month, in fact, several visits of a month each, I think. Um, Finding out, interviewing everybody in the department about how they worked, what they needed for space, how you would design a lab. Uh, Jake went off to several other well-known uh, big corporate laboratories to find out how people were designing space. And in the end, uh, Marcel Boyer's firm turned in a set of drawings. Um, he was uh, very disappointed not to be able to qualify to actually do the final drawings. Um, as has been noted, he. He didn't have that prior experience that allowed him to be a government contractor. Um, Jake's description to me of what they did was they created a front organization to, in order to execute the designs of Marcel Breuer, so Gaffney and I think Thomas was the, the two names. 
I don't really know the history of that firm, but his description to me was that they created the firm in order to be a front for this, for, to do this in a legitimate way for the government. And then once the firm was appointed, they actually wanted to modify the drawings, and so Jake's last challenge was to make sure that the drawings retained the character as drawn up by the Marcel Royer firm. And so the building was built in 1966. Um, when I arrived there in 2003, uh, uh, within, I think this is, so this is 35 years after Jake left the department, but of course he was on Long Island, he, he was emeritus at Stony Brook, but he appeared in my office within a week or two to lecture me on the fact that I not only had a department to run, but I had a building to protect. And he had a list of things that they had done to his building that were inappropriate that I should be fixing. <laughs> so he pointed outside my door to some of these partition walls that we put up now for cubicles, and he said, those have got to go. And so he gave me all the ways in which the building needed to be changed back to its original conception. Um, recently, uh, we've had contact from Stuart Leslie, who's a historian of science here at uh, Johns Hopkins. And he's writing a book on mid 20th century laboratory design. And uh, many famous architects got involved in doing designs for laboratories of corporations and um, other government institutions. Um, and he's going through how that process evolved from the 1940s. Albert Walker, who was a well-known architect at the time, did Bell Labs at Murray Hill, which is actually where I started my career. Uh, Aero Saarinen did Bell Labs at Holmdale. There were Yorktown Heights was another one. There were a set of these well-known buildings. And in getting started on his book, he decided he would bite off the first chunk by doing a chapter for Physics Today, which is the, obviously the, the journal for the American Physical Society, and uh, wrote a story about three buildings built by famous architects for laboratories, all finished in 1966. And the three buildings are the Aero Cern and Bell Labs Homedale, uh, the NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research Building, done by IM Pei in Colorado, and Marcel Breuer's chemistry building at Brookhaven. Um, and in writing that article, in writing that uh, article, he concluded that uh, Aero Saarinen's uh, home mill building is now just weeds because it no longer fits the needs of modern research. It was a it was a building built for the time when uh, AT and T was a large mon monopoly with grand designs, and they needed a huge building. It was built, I think, for 8,000 people. It's a big glass box with multiple buildings inside of it, and they can't find a user for it now. So it's just simply sitting empty. It may ultimately get ripped down for expensive houses. Uh, I think until the housing market comes back, maybe it's protected from that fate, but uh, they can't find users. Uh, the NCAR facility is an icon. It's this dramatic, you will recognize it if you see a picture, it's a dramatic, vertical structure mirroring the surrounding Rocky Mountains. Uh, but it was built with one person's vision of how you do small group research, and much of atmospheric research now is computational, big computer facilities. So while they keep the building at the center of the campus, um, much of the research itself has moved out. It's now done elsewhere by large groups using large computers. Uh, Leslie concluded that it was actually the Marcel Breuer building at Brookhaven, which retains uh, a useful future, that it had the best vision of how you can do chemistry research. It incorporated lots of things that we now find standard in laboratory buildings, but were brand new for the time. Chases down between the labs so that you could bring facilities into labs without modifying the whole building. Um, a, a series of designs for the HVAC systems, and a number of other aspects. Um, We've decided that it's worth renovating. It's one of the buildings at Brookhaven that will, uh, that is, is going through a new process of renovation. Um, we're starting actually with the first two floors of one wing, and in fact, those have just been emptied. In fact, the only occupant still sitting in those two floors is someone who has nowhere to go, and that's Stan Wong, who is sitting there temporarily because they're renovating your section in another building. But, um, we're about to start the renovation of that, and then we're hoping to move on to other sections. And the architectural report, the engineering report for that building, uh, has made clear that it was a uh, design that was well ahead of its time. It incorporated many features that we now think of as important for laboratory buildings. And I think at the heart of that was Jake's vision for the, he, he clearly drove that building committee 
He had strong views. He went around and visited all of these other laboratories, and he clearly um, established something that has enduring value. Anybody else wish to speak? In that case, why don't we take a short break and then we'll resume with the uh, uh, presentations. Yes, again, after we conclude, I'm reminding you that uh, we are getting together for dinner this evening at 6.30 downstairs in a restaurant called the uh, Moon Bay. And I'll uh, remind you once again after we, uh, uh, after we adjourn for the day. Um, uh, our next speaker is Professor Clemens, who's come from San Diego. Uh, thank you very much. Sure. Well, thanks very much for a chance to, to be here and say a few words uh, about someone and, and related to someone who I really thought the world of and who's my own life is really dependent on in a lot of ways. I'm not going to do. Uh, I thought I would, would point out along the way when it came to some part of what we do and how it relates to what Jake did, but I can't. It's just too much. It'll take forever. So I'm going to say there's nothing that I've done that involved an isotope. This is essentially I've covered everything I've done, at least as a scientist. Um, 
at some point in the way, a big Eliasson concept comes into play, whether it's the, the classical ones you've had, the color red lake rule, evaporation compensation, whatever. Uh, Dr. Kuming Ma was here, he knows, he sat at the table with me a lot of hours, and we've gone through a lot of this stuff. So I'm gonna jump in. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about oxygen. Some of you from New York may recognize this painting at the Metropolitan Muse Museum of Art. This is Lavoisier who discovered oxygen. Uh, this is his apparatus down here and here. This is, the, the plaque says this is his wife. Um, I've never verified that because I'm not that old. But, uh, I'm gonna, I, I've got two point, this is a warm seat. I've got two pointers here. I never used two because I did this once before and, and accidentally landed a small aircraft. So <laughs> I'm going to go back to one. And with mine, you can get spectroscopy on the audience too. All right. So I'm just going to basically, I switched out after lunch here, and I'm going to make it a little less technical and a little bit more what I do with the technical stuff. Um, Martin said that I do a lot of these things just to, to go to places, and I was going to stand up here and refute it, but put that would be a lie, I'm sure. So here's something interesting, is that 1947, for people in the isotope world, stable isotope, especially geochemistry, was really the birthplace. First, you've all heard about this famous paper of Jake and, and Maria and, and Yuri, 1947, um, and they're both in the same building at the same time when we wrote this paper. So that's really quite a quite a, a, an accomplishment for University of Chicago. Now, the other part of this though is that even if you took their theories, you couldn't measure them because the, the change in isotope is really small; you couldn't measure. Them. But the guy, this guy named Al Nier came up with what's called the isotope ratio mass spectrometer in the same year. And everything came together. It's like the A team, you know, the, the plan came together. And it was all in 1947. And I realized in thinking about this that I actually I did the mirror image of Jake's career. I started in Brookhaven. and I was not in the Nyston Chemistry Building. I was, in fact, in one of the barracks. And only got to the new building for Glassdoor. And then I went to the University of Chicago in Yuri's old lab. And then I went to the University of California, the satellite facility in San Diego, up there, basically. <laughs> and, uh, and worked in Mayor Hall on Yuri's old mass spectrometer. So I sort of did it in the reverse, um, but fortunately got And so I did it in Yuri Hall, um, uh, is where a lot of the measurements are now. This is the plaque that's there. I'm gonna talk about this in just a minute. This is the deuterium goat that allowed Yuri to discover the isotope of, of deuterium from the regular spectrum because of the rotational spectrum of symmetry. And in, in preparing for this, I just took a chance to look back in some old papers. And I should ask Judith this. I don't understand why the discovery of oxygen isotopes didn't win the Nobel Prize, which was like 20 years before this in Berkeley. And it was also an important verification of quantum theory. I don't know what happened, uh, but it should have. So we've talked about isotope effects, but the real trick in what we do just to say this, is that all these isotope ratios can change. There's a lot of ways to say it, and you've heard them all. Uh, you, velocity of a molecule, big guys are slower than little guys. Rotation, there's differences. Vibrations, which is the heart and soul of a lot of this. And nuclear, which I'm actually gonna talk about because it is something that Jake did, and, and no one's mentioned this a particular perspective on it that turns out to be really interesting and probably going to be bugging people for at least 10 years and probably 20. So that just says all these effects depend on mass. We measure isotope ratios. This is that thing what I said with measuring it on a mass spectrometer. We can do it really well. We just measure the daylights out of it. You know, Marilyn Fogel's here and she's one of the best in the business. And we do it really well. It's all we do with it. But we do it really well, and it's because of the ratio technique. And so we report it in this funny notation of the minor versus the major isotope, and express it as parts per thousand because they're small changes. They're not percent. So it's like pH. It's a convenient way instead of saying 10 to the minus 4 molar, you say pH is 4. Shortcut. So we look at it, and if you look at the 17 over 16 versus 18 over 16, they follow mass laws. The mass difference here is one, the mass difference is two. And if you grab stuff from the Earth and the Moon and you, and you measure them, most of them lie on this line because they all partition as a function of mass. 
It's an old rule, and, and you all have heard this before. If you've heard any of us in from the NARIO talk about this. The exception, and I am going to talk in detail about this issue later. Not in detail, but in the fun part of it that really relates to Jake's last series of papers that are really important. And, and this was by my postdoctoral mentor in Chicago, a guy named Bob Clayton, who found here's the normal big Eliasson and Mayer rules follow this trend of mass, vibrations and rotations. And then there was this exception of Clayton's, and this is measured in meteorites. The meteorite pieces that they measure it in are the oldest <coughs> objects in the solar system, with the exception of some of my colleagues in the chemistry department. They point to not a dipping at the table. <laughs> Sorry, it was a joke. <laughs> so, so it is what we're we talking about. Okay, so here's the slope of one. In this coordinate system, there's only two ways you can get it. You can add pure oxygen 16, or you can change oxygen 17 and 18, but equally. Right? It's just a ratio. And what he argued, since there's no chemical way to break away from this line, it has to be nuclear. And he argued that the most likely nuclear process is a supernova, because you make pure oxygen 16. And so you blow up a star, not you personally, but trained professionals, and add <laughs> pure oxygen 16 to the solar system. And that is what explains it. And it's all based on this basic assumption. There's no way to get off of this line. All right, so then, you know, you go and I, now I have my first real job that doesn't involve hammers and nails and, and shovels. In, in Southern California, and we made ozone, and it obeys the same relationship, exactly the same as in those old inclusions in the meteorite. Question is, all right, so number one, that kills the assumption because we we very carefully ruled out that there was no supernova debris in my laboratory. My laboratory is a mess, I admit it, but we may not tell you it's a mess, but it's not that bad. Um, so there's no supernova debris. And so this then led to the question, what is it? And my colleague John Hyden and I denied. And so this started my adventure into the big Elias world. It's at this point here. We had no clue where this came from. It's not in any of the books. And so uh, one of the things I was told was that my soft spoken colleague at, at Scripps Oceanography named Harmon Craig said, Mark, you must drive up to Irvine and talk to the best guy in the business in this world, a guy named Max Wolfsburg. He was a student. Jake Big Elias, or this man will help you out. And he was right. He did. I'm sorry Max isn't here too, but I'm glad you're taking it. Because that, that part is true. A lot of what I should say would be bored or boring. But this part is true. <laughs> this part is true. And, and, and he helped us a lot in getting through this. And he said you should read Jake's papers. And I did. I went, and in those days it was harder because you had to go to the library and Xerox things, right? So it meant days and days. And I went through and all those papers, and, and my student, John Heinrich, and I read these to each other. and went through these papers, all of them, in detail, yours too, a lot of you got. And, and, and it, did, it helped, but it didn't, it didn't solve the problem because it wasn't in any of this, but it was really worth it. It was the right time to educate me in these things. And so when I met Jake the first time, besides the Bermuda, uh, the Bermuda short scare, uh, it was really interesting. And, and, the, and the answer is this, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, I'm not going to go into any detail, but it, there are things we know that we, this ozone molecule is weird. It's one of the few things you can make by taking atoms of itself, putting three of them together or more, and have it be a gas phase molecule, and with whatever it is hanging on the ends, so that it's subject to symmetry. You can do it with carbon and hydrogen, but you can't play the game because it only has two isotopes. You gotta have three to get in. It's like going into the it's like going into the casino in Monte Carlo. You wear a tie, you don't wear a tie. You wear a tie, you get in, you don't wear a tie, you get in. So to get in this game, the equivalent of the tie is you gotta have three stable isotopes. And so ozone shows up in the effect for it shows up, and part of it is the symmetry effect, and it's why this thing with oxygen is not is important is there's a symmetry dependence where where it's all even or it's even even odd and it's the even even odd guys 
that has a property that's not really related to mass. It's more related to who's sitting where. This guy is different. If I take the red one and put it over here, different molecule. It has more states. It has more ways to do its thing, basically. Like I said, I'm not going to go into the details of this because it's far too much for even an hour lecture. And having those extra states, which is how hydrogen isotopes and oxygen isotopes were discovered, is important. And it's taken, it still isn't figured out. There's been a lot of work and a lot of theory done on this. And it comes from, and, and Professor Clinton's talk talked about Rudy Marcus. Rudy Marcus is a Nobel Prize winner. He works at a small technical institution in Pasadena, California. And, and he's developed, a, he's worked 12 years on this paper, on this ozone effect. I mean, when we first found it, I thought, this is too clean and too easy. I was worried because it was the first thing I did as an assistant professor. We'd solve it and be over. What are we going to do next? Man, I got to be tenured. Um, and so I thought it would be simple. So Rudy's been working on it for more than a decade. He's, I got to tell you, he's pretty good. Um, and it basically has to do a lot with when you have a molecule and you pump some energy in it, it's, you got to get rid of it. You can vibrate it, you can rotate it, you can fluoresce it, but you got to get rid of it. And it's important. And in the process of doing that, whether it's an isotope or not, when it breaks or exchanges, that distribution of energy is really important. And having a lot of states makes a difference. So that's the physical part of it. I, don't, I can't understand anything. Unless I understand the physical part of it, I, I, I can't do the mathematical part. 16, 16, 17, 18 converted to being totally symmetric is different. The rate constants measured by the mouse herder would show that symmetry is important. Whether it's purely symmetry or not, it's not just purely symmetry, but it is important. The structure of the molecule counts beyond the mass part. And so that's a really interesting problem in physical chemistry. It's, it still is and it will be for a long time, I'm sure, and there's other things emerging from it. But I can talk about the part that we do with it. So interesting things happen on here. This is, this is a, oh, now for something completely different. So in the climate world, we know that you have an input of ra radiation. It's, it's only coming, all the heat on the Earth comes from two things. Number one, it comes from the sun, two faculty meetings. <laughs> and, and depending on your faculty versus mine, it sort of trades places off. So, so mostly it comes in as visible light, hits the ground, and then it's radiated back out again. And in California, we think of that as the wetsuit sort of effect. How well you trap it, how good your wet speed is, how much your greenhouse here. And so this part is all really important. But a lot of the interesting part is up here in the middle of the metosphere in the top of the atmosphere. And trying to understand the chemistry up here, and that's where we use the isotopes as a probe, is really important. And, and so the problem is with, the, with up here is that it's up here. Right, your airplanes fly here. Stratospheric balloons, the big ones can go to here. And I started out in that a long time ago when I just got into this. I started flying stratospheric balloons and I hate it. I just hate it. Two things. Number one, 50% failure rate to get it to go here. Number two, Palestine, Texas. That's the National Balloon Facility from Palestine, Texas. I'm sorry, if anyone's from Palestine, Texas, I do not mean to be cruel and mean, but it's just a bad place. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a my place. I mean, I mean, you get along with, well, we mean they'll probably take it, but I'm mean, reading you know, it, it's not the place. So if you want to get a sample up in here where all this interesting chemistry, the oxidation state of the upper atmosphere and a lot of the atmosphere is controlled up here. You've got to figure it out. But you've got to get samples and bring them back. You can't do it by the space shuttle. And no, you can't stick something out of the shuttle's window that flies by. People have asked me this before. And they won't let you drill holes in the wall. I've done this in airplanes, but you can't do it in the shuttle. Um, and so you've got to sample up here. So here's how we do it. So this is the sampler, the sampler's up here. This is my first one, so I have to come proud of this. It's like showing your first baby. This is my first rocket system. And so it's a, it's a, this is a Nike. Those of you who remember the 1950s, remember the Nikes, because they were all over the place. And you can buy them from the government for a dollar. And this is a, this is a, what's known as an Orion. For those of you who speak military, it's a Hawk missile. They're 10 bucks. You gotta pay $100,000 to have them show up for White Sands missile range. And the sampler's here. And this is how you spin balance in the vehicle assembly building. This is just to make sure it doesn't 
crumble a little bit while you're flying and then come down in an unwanted place, which you don't like. Picnic benches in White Sands National Park and that sort of thing. You don't like that. This is a sampling device. It's just three chambers pumping down to 10 to minus 10 atmospheres. They're gold plated. Freezing with liquid helium so you can get it to two degrees Kelvin. Suit it up, put it in the rocket. This is the newest one. So this is the newest, newest in time edition. This is about, and uh, it's much bigger because we go higher. And basically that those chambers just freeze in the sample as it's flying. It's flying at four times the speed of sound. For those of you who are tel not calibrated with the speed of sound, that's about, it's twice the nozzle speed of a 357 Magnum bullet. Uh, thin, you know, I spent time in Chicago this week. So, um, so this, is, this is the sampling system in here. These are pyrotechnical devices to ensure separation. Those are otherwise known as plastic explosives. And he's just taking a picture to make sure He's from the, this is the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, which is obviously run by the military, and it has to, of course, be the United States Navy, because who else would run a desert facility? <laughs> so he's with the United States Navy, and he's showing me he took out the bolt, so if this blows up, it's not his fault, it's this guy's fault, and, and they'll come after him, and not him. And so this is getting ready to fly. This is on the launcher rail. This whole thing is going to go up. They're going to take this, and the building gets pulled back. And the last thing that happens is all the, this is the nose gun, this also has plastic explosives. This is a ring so that when you're in the blockhouse, or you're not in the blockhouse, the launcher area, uh, if someone uses the wrong kind of voltmeter with a low resistance, it'll set off the explosives and then this will deploy, meaning it'll explode and come apart. And there's been, I mean, there's been three people killed this way at, in this uh, facility. So this is a little safety ring we got on here. This is what it looks like when it's all fully armed, ready to fly. And then the only person who's ex expendable, you can't see him here, he's up here in front of you, so the only guy that's expendable goes and, and arms the whole thing. And then it goes up and, and it flies. And this is what it looks like when it goes, and this is where it comes down. So this is, we think you'll appreciate this. You've probably seen this, and I've told you this before. But, but you can see this little trail when you fly in a helicopter that sinks and drags for four miles through the white sands. So this is the world's most expensive gypsum sand. And so here's another picture on another trip. This is, I think, the last one we did. So the samples are there. Take them out, run them back to La Jolla, California. Take them out, do all the chemistry, and measure the stable isotopes in carbon dioxide. And this is what you get. This is from a paper in the 90s that we wrote in Science. So here's that same coordinate system. This is that line. This is, this is the big Y-Sum line. This is what you get. You calculate, so you measure, this confirm. Troposphere carbon dioxide is in equilibrium with water. And you can calculate it. It's actually, it's in his paper and it's in Yuri's paper. They go into great detail about it because paleothermometry was discovered by those papers and it's the whole basis of the whole field of being able to measure temperature changes on geological time scales. It all goes back to those papers and, and El Nero so that you can actually measure it. And that's this. That's, in my view, that's a massive contribution. I, you know, the deuterium thing that Yuri won the Nobel Prize for, he and Jay should have won it for this work. I mean, to me, it's actually has a lot more application, or, or to me, it does anyway. So here's the carbon dioxide from the cryogenic cold air sample. It's way off the line. And we understand, it's taken eight PhD dissertations and a lot of the papers to understand exactly how and quantify it including work done up at the, uh, in, uh, in the uh, Republic of Berkeley by Christy Boring using molecular beams with someone already mentioned here, Yuan Li, uh, also a Nobel laureate now in Taiwan, to figure it out. And the first, we, we knew early on what it was, but to really understand the physical chemistry it took a lot of work. And basically, when you look at the enrichment, this is altitude now. So we sampled the, in the first one up to 70 kilometers. We now sampled to 120. And the atmosphere stops at 90 kilometers. So we fly this thing out of the atmosphere, and it comes down, still within White Sands Missile Range, but it's, but it's uh, not always. But <laughs> there was, there's no need to talk about this one. Uh, actually, there's no need at all. Um, but, but what happens is, you can see the long-lived greenhouse gases are inversely correlated to it, and this is really important. This is the second reason for flying the rocket, is to be able to sort out 
how they get oxidized in the atmosphere, because the upper atmosphere greenhouse gas is being controlled by the methane and nitrous oxide. But you can't measure the intermediate players in this, because they're too small. Because the intermediate players in that is this one, it's atomic oxygen. Everybody can measure oxygen. You saw what Lossier did, and he did it with, with his um, lab assistant and his equipment. And, and ozone has been measured for decades, uh, half a century. But this one is what does all the action, and that's what you want to know. And this is where the signal comes from, because ozone has the funny isotope effect that I told you about. It photolyzes and makes this. And it's when it's in this state before it does anything, it interacts with carbon dioxide. That's where it gets it. And that's really important. And that's why, because it tells you the pictures, and that's what you want to know. But there's only 100 molecules in a cubic centimeter. In cubic centimeters, you know, there's only 100 of them. Out of something like 10 to the 16. So you can't measure it. You just can't measure it. So being, that's why understanding exactly how this thing appears and interacts with carbon dioxide was so important and so many people worked at it so hard. So again, you make this, but it's labeled. It's isotopically weird, but it's perfect. If you had a dial up, um, it's like my friend said, I go to Jerusalem a lot to do some work in theoretical physical chemistry there. And they always said, Mark, when you're in Jerusalem, you can talk to God from there because it's only a local call. <laughs> and so, <laughs> So, uh, so in this here, that's what you want to know, and it's labeled. And it interacts here and goes to here and shows up. It, it couldn't have worked better for nature to understand that process. It's absolutely perfect. But you have to understand this part, which, which took, it was a decade. It was at least a decade of a lot of people. And, it's, and it all happens in a short time scale. And it, and it fits with the fluorocarbons and sulfur hexafluoride. This is the anomaly. So we really can understand a lot about the greenhouse gas distributions in the stratosphere and how they're distributed. Now, if you want to get into rocket science, you have to realize it's a funny group of people. And so it's just a reminder um, that they have a funny sense of humor. Um, I don't know. It, it was the worst day in the history of scientific talks when Gary Larson stopped doing the far side. I mean, many of my colleagues just, we went through a period of depression. Please, you've got to come back. Man. So we're using this pathetic old stuff, but, you know, classics are classics. Um, so anyway, what were we talking about? I didn't come here. So, so thinking about other things, this is one of my favorites painting. This is in the um, Mauritius Museum in The Hague. This is a painting of Vermeer's. And he only did 38 or 39, and this is one of my favorites. And, and, and he's, he's either, you can see sitting here with calipers and thinking in, in the window, and you, and you just get the feeling he's thinking great thoughts, or he's wondering, what's for lunch? Uh, but I love this painting, and, and it reminds me that I need to think about what we want to do next. Now, this is only to tell me to make a point. And when we first found this funny effect, uh, one of my colleagues, or one of my colleagues, one of my former mentors said that it's interesting, but it's a, it's a curiosity. It doesn't occur in nature. And so this is to remind, to make a point that every molecule in the atmosphere that has oxygen in it is anomalous. All of them, except for maybe water. So instead of it being some sort of lab curiosity, all of them, even O2, the major element, they're anomalous, but for different reasons. And so by understanding, that's why I said when I take the big lines and rules, and apply them to everything. You have to know them and apply them really well to interpret all this other stuff. It's critical. You can't play the game if you don't understand those and refine and continually work on them. So that's part of it. So here's another trick of labeling. I'll walk, I'm not gonna even walk through this, but here's the point to be made. In atmospheric science, one of the things, if you wanna understand how particles are made, issues with biodiversity and whatnot, where the particles are made and, tr and transferred. A lot of it occurs in the sulfur and nitrogen zone. Okay. But figuring out where things came from is really tricky, or how they're made. That turns out to be really important. So if you grab an atmospheric scientist, if you're walking down on the shores of the Potomac and say, you, if you're an atmospheric chemist, what would you really like to know in 
that I'd really like to be able to sort out if things are made in a gas phase or a liquid phase. It's really important. Homogeneous versus heterogeneous. It's a big deal. In the gas phase, so again, nature, I mean, we really got lucky. Is that in the gas phase, it all runs through this. Most atmospheric reactions run through this. And in the liquid phase, they go through ozone and hydrogen peroxide. And we spent, and this was another 10 year effort, we measured all the reactions, all the isotopic phase, and learned how to measure these things in the atmosphere. So you know what you need to know, that if you measure the particles of sulfate and nitrate, you can answer that question. And it's really important in today's answer. Like if you're living in California, what Judith and I would like to know, how much is coming from China? That's not an insignificant question. Because if you're pushing down your regulations, and a lot of it's being transported from India, China, Pakistan, whoever, um, you'd like to know that. That's not an easy thing to answer. But if you know how they're made, then you have something to say about how they're transported. And so if now knowing all these things, if you measure them in the atmosphere, you can figure that out. And we know it. And so that's been done to generations of, of some graduate students and postdocs, not me because I'm not clever enough, but they figured it out and it worked it. So that in today's atmosphere is really important. But what's more interesting is if you want to tell if your models are right, you want to be able to predict the future. Now you can be patient and wait for 10 years to see if it bears out right. And, and I, I'm a lot of things, but patience is not one of them. So if you want to test it, you can go back in time. And that's the way, that's an advantage in this field to understand if all this is working right, that you can do. So you can go back and you want to study these things, how did it happen in the past? Now I'm going to share something. As I just said, I spent, I spent three or four years time in, in Israel, both doing some theoretical quantum work with a fellow named Rafi Levine, and some of it out in the desert collecting samples. And in this last trip, when I went to the southern desert uh, to collect samples, I stamped, stopped along the way in Masada. And um, all of you know the story, you know the story, and it's, and it's a, an amazing place. And while there, I started working on a new idea. So I'll share it with you as they go on, because it's, it's not copyrighted yet. So this passing, I'm working with teleportation. So here's my first attempt at doing this. It didn't work out right. This is an assistant in Masada. So those of you who watch Star Wars and our Star Trek know that this is tricky business. So I got it here. It's tricky, but it, and I, I almost got it. If this had been six months, I might have it by now. But don't talk about this because, like I say, it's not copyrighted. Now, if now you apply this and look at sulfate and nitrates in ice cream, this is Becky Alexander's work, going back from, the, from now, back through 140,000 years. You find this funny oxygen anomaly that changes. The red line is the temperature of the Earth. It's made by, it's not by me, this is an industry. I mean, maybe we'll tell you, there's, I know, hundreds of people. There's so many of them, they have their own hotel and, and conferences, there's so many of them. <coughs> And this is the temperature record that you get, and it's from looking at water isotopes. And Alex, the guy who really, you know, with their work, that started this whole field, being able to understand evaporation and condensation and isotope effects in temperature. So you can get the temperature. And it follows this. But it's not the temperature. What it is, is the amount of liquid water. Because when it goes to zero, that means it's pure one of those circles. Pure mass dependent. This is the glaciation time, right? It's low temperature, it's cold. That's how we define glaciation to cover up this thing. And so in those times it goes down because the oxidation pathway is switched. Whereas in now, it's about half and half going to the liquid and gas phase. There's no other way to get this record. What you're getting is paleo ozone levels and levels and the water content of the atmosphere. This is critical. If you're trying to write climate models, you need to understand what clouds are doing. We can't measure clouds. We're going on in what's in the newspapers, going back in time. So if you want to measure 100, 200,000 years ago, this is the way to do it. It's the only way to do it. So what you're getting out of this is number one, the oxidation change of the earth. Number two, the water content. So this has turned out to be actually a really nice application. But one of the things you'd like to do with this is understand short-term change 
in climbing, meaning six months at a time, beyond back hundreds of years. Now, to do that, you have to go back in time, but high resolution ice sand, which means you can't use ice cores. And this is just, this is a chart of what I said. So here's where you go. You go here, you go to the South Pole. It's three centimeters every six months, all the way down. It's like that old joke about turtles all the way. You, got, you know, you got a couple miles of ice till you hit bedrock, which is not really snow. And so you go all the way down to bedrock. And so you got a lot of ice. So you can, and it's a very constant deposition. The South Pole is nothing else, but nothing else that's constant. That's cool too. <clears throat> and so you can get a six month record. You can't do ice cores. You have to get slabs because you have to get enough stuff to measure to get that really high resolution. So here's how you do it. First, you got to get people to go. Gotta convince graduate students. This is an article. This was published in the New York Times by a guy named Ernest Shackleton. Uh, those of you who read his, his book, Endurance, probably one of the greatest adventure stories. This is how to get people to go. Uh, so it's not bad. It's not bad. So here's here's the South Pole. Here's my student Justin McCabe. Here's myself, and and so it worked. So Justin volunteered to go. And, and, we, and we were here. And this South Pole is fascinating for approximately six minutes. So this is, in the, this is in the first four minutes, so things are still okay. And this is the South Pole, you know, and you can, you know, it's 10,000 feet, so you can run around the Earth three times and then throw up and pass out. I guess, I guess it's much as old as fun. So, so here's where you work for about a month three weeks to a month, it's, and it's wonderful, this is it. And there's three more pictures, just like this from each direction. <laughs> and here it is. So what you do is you dig a snow pit, and it's about 23 to 24 tons of snow. You dig it by hand. And, and here's, this is me at the bottom of the pit, when it's halfway, it's about halfway gone. And then you take slab, and it has to be clean. So here you are, the South Pole is not remote enough. So you have to go five to six miles out. So that you're clean. And then you dig this stupid snow pit, which is pretty much the best description, and then dig slabs. But it's you can't contaminate, otherwise you go through all this crap stuff. And and so you have to see that the surgical bar. So here you are, and you it's the you know, it's I got it's the damnedest thing, you know. And you and you dig it, you sample it, and you take it back to analyze for the isotopes. Um, but this is how you do it. I mean it's just hand digging. I mean, I always, I always told everyone I worked in high school in construction, and it's a complete lie, it doesn't hit you. And, and I always said, man, I'm gonna work my butt off. I'm not gonna do this big thing <laughs> ever again, so didn't get very far on that one. So anyway, what you get out of this is when you look at the isotope data, you can pull out the natural cycles, and that's really important. Because when you give talks, David and I were speaking a little bit earlier about talking to people, and you know, and when you talk to a group of people, you know, like the Rotary College, they'll ask a really good question, and they do in Congress. How do you know it's not a natural cycle? That's a really good question, and it's about the hardest one of them all to answer. So when you go back three months of time for a long time, you can then look for regularities. And you do buy this trick by some French guy named Foyer. He just developed his trick, and you can get these regularities. So here you see a two and a half year cycle, that's a quasi-biennial oscillation. It's a big wave that goes around the world. The world. And at that time, it then, the ozone levels and, and the anomalies change in the South Pole. Here's El Nino. Us West Coast people are really familiar with this. You have to tell your head about it. The El Nino shows up here. And then here's the 11 year sunspot cycle. We don't know why this should show up here or here. It does. And we know it's natural because we can look at any other record. But we know those. So we can pull these away and say, all right, we've hardwired, we know the natural cycle. So when something's showing and it correlates with something else, like a man-made activity, we have more certainty. It's not 100%, but we're understanding a lot about nature for doing it. The only problem with this is that when you go to talk to your uh, leaders in Washington, you go wandering up the hill, and they'll say, well, Mark, isn't the Antarctic a weird place? And they say, Man, you got me. You know, it's like the Bermuda Shores. 
And so you got to go someplace else. You got to prove that it's not just a southern hemisphere or penguin sort of thing. So you got to go someplace else. And, and we also got to understand something about the polar stratospheric clouds. And that turns out to be really interesting because it's particle surface chemistry, which in physical chemistry is interesting all by itself. If you want to do it, then you got to go to the same altitude, but north. And here's the only place you can go, which is the Greenland summit. And it's also at 11,000 feet. And I would show you the pictures of the South Pole, but you wouldn't know the difference. It's, it's warmer. The South Pole, you know, that time of year when we went, it's about 40 below. And here it's OK. It's, you know, it's, it's a cold, you know, it's 20 below. But if you're from, like you said, like upstate New York, and you spend time during the winter, you see it. Every now and then you see it. You don't like it, but you see it. Chicago, you've seen it. Don't like it. I'm from Miami. I don't like any of this, actually. <laughs> so we went. Three years ago to Greenland, and we did the same thing as Forrest Gump would say again. And, and but I sometimes, well, how did you feel going back? I'm like, did you really love it? You must love it. You're from Miami. You must love going back to the Greenland summit. So here's a picture of how thrilled I was. <laughs> I was just, I was just as happy as a pig in mud. Um, but the interesting thing, thing that came out of it is that what you get out of it is, is what I would. Those of you who do quantum chemistry would understand this perturbation theory. If you want to understand how things really work, perturbations are actually really important. Quantum mechanics, perturbation theory is really important. And the Earth has perturbed itself a number of times in volcanoes. And so what we were able to find with the funny sulfur anomalies is that the stratosphere gets perturbed. And in understanding that, we see it both in the Antarctic and the Arctic. And wait, it's the other way around. But it's all relevant anyway. Um, is that the perturbations occur from the plume of sulfur dioxide? So you have a half a circumference of the Earth that, are, that the photochemistry of the stratosphere occurs, and it answers the question: How fragile is the Earth? The volcanoes have done it for you. The guy who actually first discovered the perturbations in the isotope record is this fellow right here. Um, and it senses it. It's actually very fragile. And so it gives us a way to track what happens. And you can see the plume of this go in the north and the south in the isotopes. And you don't need to understand this is that from the snow, which means more recent here over here. And you can see the isotopes change. This is the isotopes change from two different volcanoes, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic. One of the interesting perturbations in that, one of the coldest, I think it's the coldest in recorded history in winter, was in 1809, it was never clear why. Was there a volcano? If there was, when was it? And what, if we know when it was, where was it? So we were able to track it down to the equator, and the volcano occurred somewhere between Christmas of 1809 and the first week of, of January of 1810, with that level of precision. But it's only because you do the snow pit thing instead of the core, so you can get a big enough sample to really measure close in time. So, whether or not it's worth it, it's, it's much more worth it if you can send someone else. <laughs> so, yeah, so once you get these sort of things and see what's going on in nature, pace and look around. So I like to look at things differently. You always hear the story about the tent. The camel gets its nose under the tent. And once the camel gets its nose under the tent and looks around, then, you know, all hell breaks loose. But I look at it a different way. So here's actually a different picture. Here's the camel inside the tent looking out. <laughs> this has nothing to do with it at all. Um, <laughs> One of the most, I think this is the most interesting experiment the Earth has ever done. And, and I, I'm not only doing this because William Bao is here, and, and he's the guy that discovered something really interesting in this, but, but because there's some really important biology here. And I know that there would be a lot of people here that have some interest in this. And here's what happened. The Earth freezes solid somewhere hundreds of millions of years ago. And and my colleagues that do the snowball earth business for a living, there's a lot of debate about how, why, and what not. I think there's no debate about a freezing solid. But the why and what not, it's, it, they argue. I would, you would, that's a good way to put it, you know what I mean? They argue about this. But it seems to me when the earth is all in one piece, that it conspires at that time to be in the equator. So it's warm and wet. And if you do geochemistry, you know when it's warm and wet and you've got rock, you use up carbon dioxide to wear down the rock. 
geochemical weather. So it's sucked out the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, essentially. And the normal greenhouse effect went away in there, it's pro-solid. Now, whether it's pro-solid or cracked here and there, you know, it's not clear. But it, for me, it was close enough. You know, it's like you say, it's, it's close enough to get the CR. But here's the interesting part, and this is a plot that I got from that we named something. This is the really interesting part. So the oldest rocks on Earth are about here. Plus or minus the width of my finger. And then there's some oxygen building up here. And part of what I'll talk about with from James Farquhar uh, is that we can measure how oxygen evolves here. Then oxygen levels go up about 2.2 billion years ago. Van Dyke is here. And it goes high. Don't know when, that's, but life changes, there's algae. But life until here, if you will, life here is just algae, bacteria, and There's not a lot of life. It's like, it's like downtown La Jolla after midnight. <laughs> there's just not a lot going on. You know, it's quiet, it's nice, but, but there's not a lot there. Um, and so, but here's the Earth freezing solid. Freezes solid. And then it unfreezes. And look, everybody shows up. Why? I mean, it's there. There's no debating this unless you're like, I mean, you can debate it, but you have to be, uh, you know, come from a different religious perspective. But life shows up here, it's in the fossil record, right? There's, it's there. Go to the, you, you can see it in, 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 the, in the fossil record. So it changes. So what happened here? Who did what to do is the way I, how I can put it, is really important. And so understanding of how much, where, and whatnot is critical. If you want to answer that question. And it's close enough in time that there's samples around to get at to really start taking an understanding of this. Now, the only thing to remember or to get out of this is that oxygen in the atmosphere, here's my funny rocket program part, right? And a lot of people, because the boring's work, a lot of these, and understanding this part of it. So we got that hard part. We can measure this and see the anomaly. But when carbon, when you get that funniness in here, it comes at the expense of this. And you have to have material balance. In geochemistry, we call it Baldi's Law. Baldi's Law is some of it, plus the rest of it equals all of it. So you always have to obey Baldi's Law. So if this guy gets heavy, this guy gets light, and vice versa. So when this guy got it isotopically enriched, this guy gets isotopically light. Okay, that's all there is to it. So what we may get in this paper, uh, three years ago, and he always told me, Mark, you can have the plot, but you gotta show my picture. You gotta show my picture, right? Here's his picture. See, so, you know, I'm good on work. And when the snow over earth melts, all that carbon dioxide has to come out. You know, it's like when snow melts in Chicago in the spring. Everything that's been in that ice for a couple months comes out. It's not necessarily pretty there. Here, you get little bands, and these are what the geologists talk about is called cap carbonate. The carbonates are kept off the period. And that's the carbon dioxide. So that was what was trapped. So that's what he goes, what he means takes, and takes out the sulfate to look at it in here. And what you find is that it has a negative anomaly. Everybody else in the whole free world is up here. But he found it negative. And as far as most of us can figure out, there's only one way to figure it out, and it's because of the Baldi law thing. The oxygen turned funny because the carbon dioxide went so high. If you jacked up the carbon dioxide so much, you preserve the oxygen. And if you model that, what it shows that under different scenarios, your carbon dioxide levels may have went up as much as 25,000 parts per million instead of 400. Massive amounts. So what did this, what did all this have to do with life evolving it? Nobody knows, but you got to. But it's all related somehow, and there's a lot of people working on it. To me, this is one of the most interesting things of, of, of the isotope record that any of us have looked at in a long time. So trying to understand that is really important. And and so just for a last sentence or two of going back further in time, just to remind me of presenting a view of the view of the universe. This is in the Hieronymus Bosch Museum, also in the Hague. Um, and this is called the universe. It's two panels and it's called the universe. No, it's not the scale of winning. I know you're going to ask me this. There's no rock hammer here. So this is the universe, but it's not the scale.
And um, it must be nice to have a museum named after yourself so you can always remember where to go. Um, so this is the universe. And what my colleague James, or, or my former colleague James Farquhar, who's working, is a professor here now in Maryland, found he came to measure meteorites first. And he measured Mars meteorites, because we all love Mars. You know, it never takes much for most of us to get interested in measuring a Martian rock. I mean, it's just one of our things. And he measured Martian meteorites for sulfur in the sulfates, because they're made from minerals, which you make from liquid water, which you care about on Mars. And he found that there was a funny anomaly in sulfur, a meteorite called Nakla. It fell in Nakla to Egypt. And it's famous. If you're not a meteorite person, no, this is a very famous meteorite. It's controversial, but Nakla is the only meteorite that ever killed a dog. Not everyone, the Smithsonian says in the Smithsonian Catalog and Museum that it did. But I hate to say it, it's just this close to the wedding. But the British Natural History Museum waffles and says it's reputed to have killed a dog. <laughs> I know that it did. We found a dog here. But it has sulfur anomaly that, we, that, you know, since we've been doing atmospheric work, James understood that it must come from something photogenic. In which case, did the laboratory experiments and zeroed in on sulfur dioxide. Now sulfur dioxide, and this is actually something we worked on as a, as a graduate student when I was in Brookhaven, is photolyzes at short wavelengths. It doesn't happen today because you've got ozone. Ozone hardly bands removes all this light and it doesn't totalize the ground level. If you took away all the oxygen in ozone, that funny sulfur stuff would show up today. But you'd have to take all the oxygen in ozone out of the atmosphere. But what about in the Archean between those old rocks at 3.8 to 2.2? If there was no oxygen then, you should see a sulfur funny effect in the rocks. And so James measured it. And that turns out to be true. And, and here's now, here's the evolution of oxygen, and here's the oldest rocks. And this is positive sulfur, and this is negative. See, it's heavy oxidized and reduced reservoirs. What this is from is photolysis in an oxygen free atmosphere, or low. So you can calculate from this how much oxygen. If you want to understand the origin of the atmosphere and life in general, you have to know how much oxygen there was. That's the most, and there's no other way to get it. This is the first time there's been a quantitative record. Is it a clean and easy thing? No. Is there a lot of ways to understand it? You saw briefly the, the, the things that are in there in terms of uh, what's going on. But, but it gives a chance from, from this, and, and a lot of people doing it now, to track the evolution of oxygen. So, one thing I want to leave you with is Jake's most recent thing. And this is nuclear shielding effect. This turns out to be really important, and for ways that you're not going to guess. Or maybe you, you don't get it all because you, you know. But if you look at how the abundance of the elements, they follow a pattern like this because they're made in stars, except for hydrogen and a little bit of helium, which is made in the big and so they're all made in stars, and we understand those. And, and, um, and, and a lot of this was, in fact, discovered by, an important part was discovered by Maria Mayer. And this is a cross section of a star where the nuclear event happened. Here's an iron nickel core when it's all evolved, and all the elements getting formed. This is in a, in a red giant. And this is just some classical pictures of, of, of the supernova going off on the edge of some more, uh, molecular cloud. And here's a better picture of the supernova event. But we study meteorites. A lot of us have studied to understand that, because you have old things that reflect nucleosynthesis. So the best tests of nucleosynthesis are here. This is a calcite, they're actually not very good. And so the basic rules everyone in the starting in 47 do to understand how stars work is measure isotopes and meteorites. It goes all the way back to the early 1950s in Chicago and, and using and sorting it out needed the rules set about by these three people. You had to. 
And that was fine. Everybody in this field for understanding those star processes was fine. They were happy. In this world, in that community, these people don't get along very well with each other. They just don't. They really say things to each other that are embarrassing. It is, they argue like crazy. But at least they agreed that this was star stuff. And, and the first time I remember hearing about this was at this Gordon conference you mentioned that Jake was talking about it at a Gordon conference, but it was a Blackboard sort of thing. And it wasn't until later that it got published. But I remember him very clearly talking about it in uranium on a blackboard in one of these conferences in, in New Hampshire, whichever ones they are where you have to stop at the state lines make sure you don't hit the liquor store to kill your car. Um, and, and so that's, I remember him talking about it there. And basically what you find, and, and you heard it earlier, is a funny isotope effect for odd nuclei because of the nucleus. And it behaves differently, this is the plot. In, in, and it was shown up in experiments, and it shows up for the odd nucleus. And it's, and it's this, and, and I, I can't, it's running together now, but you have the normal big Eliasson equation, but you got this last correction in here that comes in because of a, of a nuclear field shift. When you have an odd nucleus in there, it's magnetic, and you got an electron cloud, and it's, has a magnetic because it's electrons they are moving and they interact. So the electron you can calculate has some probability of being in the nucleus. And it changes the volume of the electrons. And those of us that are chemists know that if you change the electrons, you change chemistry. Right? So you've changed the volume of the electron cloud, which means you've changed chemistry. But it's only for the odd ones. It's the ones that, that Maryland loves because they show up in NMR. Right? They're the NMR active guys because they show up. And so that's what this effect is. It shows up because of it. And it shows up in chemical reaction. And there's a number of people that worked it out, following up on it. But here's the problem, which I'm going to end with. And it's not my problem, for it, uh, maybe. So that when you want to understand the solar system, you measure it. And you understand the R process and the S process, the adding a neutron and decay. You take out, these are the high temperature inclusions I mentioned, the oldest objects in the solar system, except for the old enough. And you measure the pattern. So here's the mass number. Here's barium. And these are all done by a, a fellow who, who wanted to convey um, his greetings of a good friend of Jake's named Jerry Wasserberg. 